I'm Kristen Gilger, Associate Dean. I'm going to moderate the panel tonight. Thank you for coming. Uh, we have um, a, a development team here from AZ Central, Republic Media. Uh, I should, before I introduce everybody, I should note that one of our panelists, Samantha Bush, who is actually a graduate of the Cronkite School, was going to be on this panel. Um, she was, what was her job at, a at, at AZ Central? a mobile producer of some kind, but she took a new job and moved to LA. So, um, she's not here. Uh, but let me introduce our other panelists. So, um, to my left is Gary, and I'm gonna try to get this right. Nakanalua, oh, Nuk Nakanalua, I got it, okay. Um, Gary is the Digital Product Development Manager for AZ Central Arizona Republic. He has 10 plus years of digital product design, development, and tech startup experience. He was previously creative design director for CodeWorks Design Studio, user experience designer for Blackboard. I know, you, I know you're familiar with that. And so if you have complaints about Blackboard, you can uh, address them to Gary. And he was a developer for Lockheed Martin. Um, next to him is Penny Walker. Uh, Penny is an, is, I, I called her a native of Phoenix and she said she moved here when she was four and I said that counts. Um, she studied journalism at the University of Kansas and interned at the newspaper in Springfield, Missouri, which I didn't realize this, but she likes to point it out, is the home of Brad Pitt. Um, she came uh, back to Phoenix to work for a Valley trade magazine, but it lasted only about a month before she was drawn back to newspapers. She joined the Republic in 1999 and has worked as a copy editor in news, sports, community, and features, and as a designer and a writer and editor of the health, home, and money sections, and now as editor of AZ, the tablet magazine which I don't know if you've seen, but you'll get a glimpse of it tonight, and it's beautiful. Um, and next to Penny is Bill Guthrie. Bill is senior developer for azcentral.com, where he's worked since 2005, is that right? Um, developing software and managing the development team. He has a bachelor's and master's degree in managing computer information systems, and he got his start at Motorola in 1987 in semiconducting conductor manufacturing. After completing his BA degree, he started working in an automation group, writing Java, and later worked with several other groups, mostly in research and development. He's taking another uh, turn in his career uh, next week when he leaves the Republic to come to the Cronkite School, where he's going to be a technologist, the technologist in residence and senior developer at the New Media and Innovation Lab, uh, working with Retha Hill. So Bill is joining our staff as of Monday, right? He was just asking about parking, so if anybody has good parking advice, uh, please see um, Bill afterward. So. Um, I want to get started, and we're going to leave some time for questions afterward, and we're also going to have some visuals for you because each of these three very creative people are going to show you some of their work. A couple of questions before we do that. Um, it's interesting to me that the three of you come from very different backgrounds. You know, Gary started out as a developer for Lockheed Martin. Bill did something, which I don't understand, in semiconducting <laughs> conductor manufacturing. And Penny has a much more traditional journalism background. But somehow, you all ended up on the mobile team uh, at the Republic. And how did that happen? And how did the skills you learned early in your career help you in what you do now? So yeah, we'll start with, with Gary. Well, so I got my start at AZ Central because of this man right here. He actually was the one that hired me. Um, yeah, so I, I had been doing responsive web app development for some time, working for Blackboard. Before anyone says anything, I worked on the Blackboard Transact side, not on the education side. So if you despise the way that product looks, I had nothing to do with it. Um, <laughs> Disclaimer. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I've always been in and around development for my entire professional career. Um, so the transition to mobile just made sense um, because 
I think with mobile development, at least you're the most intimate with the user. So all these things that for development, we go, we wish we knew more, we wish we could do more with the user. Uh, when it comes to mobile, we, we're right there, we're in their hands, we're in, next to their ear, we're everywhere that they are. Well, I, my true love was copy editing. Um, at KU, we had to take reporting 101 and editing 101 as our very first two classes. I know it's a little different here at ASU. Um, and once I took copy editing, I thought, yeah, I don't want to be a reporter at all. So I was in that for years and years. And a few years ago, the Denver Post laid off 75% of its copy editors. So for me, it was more of a moment of, OK, it's time to get some new skills to survive the changing industry. Um, and so I am, I'm barely into the technical side with these guys, not anywhere near what they do, but you always have to have the reader first in all of that. So you always have to have a story and you have to have it readable and all of that. So no matter how technical it gets, you still have to have the content side of it. So neither side can survive without the other as we move forward. I actually started writing software when I was about 15. I uh, spent a summer uh, working at a pizza place, and I earned enough money to buy a Commodore 64. That probably shows you how old I am. You probably don't know what that they is. They don't even know what that is. Yeah, they don't know what that is. But <laughs> do you? All right. Strength in numbers. Let's stick together. So I, I wrote basic, and uh, I kind of got away from it until I finished my degree. I was working at Motorola doing semiconductor processing uh, in a photography area, and you probably don't know what that is. but. Uh, once I finished my degree, uh, I started with an automation team. We were writing software that created bill of materials for products and things like that. But I always uh, had sort of a knack for uh, development. And so uh, I moved into web programming at Motorola and, and a couple of R&D uh, groups where we were doing things uh, where we were pitching to General Motors, uh, the navigational systems that you all have now in your cars. We were pitching it back in 2001, 2002. And, uh, we built systems, back-end systems, front-end. I did most of the web stuff. Uh, one of the first projects I ever did was it had a little dot on a map, and it would move because your car would send back a signal as to where you were. And then eventually it gets to the edge of the map, and it would reload. And there's a lot of math that goes into that. I'm pretty proud of it. But anyway, so uh, when I came to the Republic, uh, we just did uh, web programming. And then uh, we had someone leave, and so I just kind of fell into a role where I took over a WAP uh, website. It was, it was a really watered down uh, mobile, I would I wouldn't only say mobile friendly, it was just really mo uh, watered down uh, website, a version of AZ Central. Uh, it was mainly for uh, Blackberry phones, that's how old it was. Uh, really small screens, uh, not much content there. But we took that over in 2010, 2011, and that's when we started to build AZ Central, uh, the brand on the mobile side. So that's kind of how I got my start and how it evolved to where I am now. Well, I have to ask Gary and Bill, so how much of, of a shock was it to go into a newspaper environment after your, where you came from? For me, it was night and day. I mean, it was really drastic, the change, uh, because of the editorial process and some of the constraints there and things like that. And so uh, I was, we were having a brief discussion earlier about some of the challenges uh, as far as technology goes. I think uh, some of the challenges we have as technologists is to find a way to play nice with that editorial process. And the example that I gave, like when I first started, they said, Bill, we want a blogging system. You know, we want that as a part of Easy Central. And so I went out and, you know, we found an open source solution and we added to it and we plugged it into Easy Central. But the problem was that it gave uh, editors and writers the ability to just put something out there instantaneously instead of going through that editorial process where an editor would you know, look at the copy and the uh -oh. title and images uh -oh. and things like that. And so <laughs> they had a lot of concern about that in the beginning. So that was, that was one of the, the biggest challenges for us. I'm sure Penny set you straight quickly about the importance of copy editing. Yes. yes. <laughs> Gary, was it a shock for you? Yeah, because I came from an environment where um, it was very structured. You knew what product you was working on. Um, you could plan accordingly. And in the newsroom, things happen quickly. Um, and so the ability for us to be able to, you know, plan a month in advance, for example, was it was a nice to have, but it probably isn't going to happen. Um, so that was probably the biggest shock for me was just uh, how rapid everything tends to happen. Okay, you're all nice about newsroom people. So, All right, so when I think about what you do, it seems to me that all of you do 
something that's kind of part journalism, part design, and part technology. Right, do you agree, and I'm going to put you on the spot, which of those is the most important? Penny, we'll start with you. Because I think I know what your answer is going to be. <laughs> well, yeah, it, we are at the basis a media organization, so it has to be journalism-based. It has to have a reason behind it that we are, we're communicating to the reader in some way. Um, <clears throat> of course, the way that we get that to them is changing over the years, and so technology becomes more and more important to the point now that it's, I mean, I remember when the AZ Central crew, they were on a different floor. Um, no one really understood how the website worked. They didn't understand where the stories came from. They were, they were completely divorced from the newsroom. And then around the uh, millennium, they, they moved them physically into the newsroom to try to integrate it, and it was still a while before people automatically thought, oh yeah, this story should also go on the website, not just I the, remember those the, days. the print page. And it really was a sea change. It was, it's so normal now, we forget what a big change it was. And so that helps each additional technology change. It's not as hard. When we started the tablet and we had to kind of evangelize and go to meetings with editors and show them some of the things I'm gonna to show tonight. And it was not as hard because of what people before us had done. Um, but if you don't have the journalism behind it, it's just a cool toy. And, Gary, and, Bill, you yeah. agree? I, it's hard for me to pick one, but if, since I have to, I would agree with Penny that without the content, um, it's a, a really neat looking thing that does something, but we don't know what it is. Uh, the, I think the key behind the journalism, we'll just label this as content in general, is your content really has to polarize the audience and the technology and the design drives that. It, it helps push that. So, you know, sure we could put content on a flat page and say, here you go, but there's there's nothing, you know, um, that doesn't polarize anybody. It's like, okay, I, I'm gonna move on. And so when you add in technology and you, you wrap it in this great design and you improve that user behavior, um, now you've got a much more compelling product. Okay. So, but short answer, I would say, the journalistic content. All right, now now you're on the spot. Well, I'll, I'll play the rebel on the panel. But I, I think that content in the past uh, was the most important thing. But I think you have to tell a story now. And I think you, uh, applications and development and design help tell that story. I, I think that you can find news anywhere. But uh, why do you go where you go? It's because you get it the way you like it. And, and what does that mean? It, it has a lot to do with design. It has a lot to do with the way an app flows. Uh, it, has to, it has to do with uh, how soon you get the content, when you get the content. Uh, it, used, it used to be, I, I would read sports articles based on the writer. And now it's, all I want is short stories with pictures and videos. And, and so I, I think the editorial content becomes less and less important as we evolve uh, but does technology. it have to be good short stories and well, video? I, I think that's arbitrary. I think that's for the user to okay. decide. I mean, right. I, I think a lot of the stuff I read is really bad, but it's <laughs> delivered to me in a way that uh, it, it, I'm, I'm okay with it. I, I see it and I move on and I, I'm on to the next thing where I think previously articles were really long where part of the challenges we had was pagination, you know, uh, page one, page two, page three, and now it's two or three graphs and, and you're on to the next story. So, so I think it's the way in which you deliver the content has a lot to do with your audience. Uh, the challenges at AZ Central, they always talk about getting the 18 to 44 year old, and I think the technology is what's gonna bring them in. I think the content is why you go there, but the experience is what keeps you. Interesting I, I do agree with that because what we found with the way we present stories in the magazine on the tablet is people will read a 180 inch story that they might not read in print because it looks so much better and we have ways of kind of fooling you that you don't realize how long it is and we've had people tell us how much more they enjoy reading it there and therefore they read it as opposed to just sort of skimming through it in other ways. So absolutely the way it's presented is a key part of it but I think you still have to have that core piece to it. Yeah, because I'm just, I'm reminded of like those horrible sci-fi movies that they try to slap in all these special effects to, to try to fill in the gap that the storyline just is horrible. And it's like, it becomes a joke in and of itself. But I mean, yeah, you look at, you know, sticking on the movie metaphor, you look at like Avatar, which it's got a very simplistic storyline that people understand. But, you know, you wrapped it in this, this wonderful design and all this great technology, and now you craft this entire immersive experience. And I think that's 
probably a good way of illustrating what we're trying to accomplish with what we do. It's that same basic concept. Right. I just well, have one other comment. Yeah, go, ahead, if, yeah. if go to any new, go to any movie theater and sit towards the back and look forward. And everybody's got their phone out. And what are they doing? They're consuming news in different ways. So they're in Facebook. And they're on Instagram. You know what I mean? So they're doing all these things, and I think it has a it, it has to do with the way that they're presented the information. I find out most of what I find out via Twitter. I follow a, new, a lot of news organizations and things like that, and they just give you a small graph, and, and you're on to the next thing. Oh, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman died. Okay, yeah, you know. I, so I think it's the way in which you're given this information. But but the news people have to catch up to that. They have to deliver the news like that. Some flip, swipe. You know, quick graphs. You know, give me the meat of the story and let's let's move on, kind of thing. And and give me related things like videos and you know other articles on the same type of story or something like that. I, I think that's going to become more and more important. And then I read the really long profiles of Philip Seymour Hoffman. So <laughs> you're both right. Um, it's a good transition to the next thing, which I want, and this will be the fun part. Um, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to show some of their work and just sort of talk through what they're doing in terms of the journalism and the technology and the design. So, um, Bill, I think we were going to start with you. Oh, or it, we don't have to. No. But, okay. So, um, what you're looking at here is uh, one of the last apps that we uh, put together. It's the AZ Central uh, Sports app. Is, is that mic on? Or? Is this mic, mic on? on? So this 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 will prove prove my point. I think this is one of the cooler apps we have, but we have no traffic. No one comes to this app. So is it a matter of uh, them not knowing about it? Or is it a matter of the content? Is it a matter of the technology? Don't know. But uh, if you download this app, it's currently a free app. It's the Easy Central Sports for Android. But essentially, this is an article listing. And what we try to do here is on the first article, we always try to feature the content. And so we put a big uh, image there with some text, and then this is actually scrollable, and there's about 30 articles in this list. And I believe this next one, I actually, uh, imagine if I touched that, that, that graph at the top there with that image, and it takes you to an article page. Uh, I, this would be really nice if I could scroll and show you some of the nice things, but you can see where we've integrated the top right there, the comments, so you can actually uh, Facebook comment on this article. And the icon just below that is if you want to share it, you can email it to someone, put it on Twitter, Facebook, things like that. Um, let's see. Uh, this, is, uh, this has to do more with some of the content we try to bring to some of the sports enthusiasts. So we have scores every day you know, for the different sports. Uh, NBA is kind of current, so I, I, I put that as a graph here. And this is a standing. So uh, a lot of the app has to do with data. It's data driven. So we try to deliver this kind of content to the sports enthusiasts. This is kind of neat in that uh, it's, it's more up to date with the technology. So for photos and videos, what we try to do here is put a bunch on the page. And what's interesting, if you rotate this, it's, it's sort of a responsive design. So you get three across now. But if you were to rotate the device, you get five or six across. And then it's scrollable. And then if you see on the right there, videos, uh, you can actually swipe this. And it'll get to the next section that shows videos in the same manner that you see it here. But if you were to touch one of these, you'd go into a slideshow. And you can sit there and flip through. So I just, had, I just had a couple of things, and that was, that's pretty much what I have for that app. So yeah. any questions about that? Any questions about, yeah. Do you find that the swiping and the scrolling really attracts people to the app? Is that why you try to integrate it so much? So uh, what we try to do is we try to take great content and give it to the user in the way that they want to use it. And so we provide feedback methods for all of our apps where you can tell us what you like. And so what we try to do in that case, uh, you can actually swipe or you could tap on the tops to get to where you wanted to go. And so we try to provide sort of this seamless experience for users. But all too often, often in the newer apps, you, you, users do this kind of thing. You know, they're pinching, they're zooming, they're scrolling. And so we try to provide that. And that's, that's kind of what we did there, just try to update the app so it, it just follows suit with most of the apps in the market that are doing well. So any others? Um, so about a year and a half ago, maybe a little more than that, um, they started thinking about at the, the Republic a way that they, you know, a, a different way to present the news. And they started realizing um, that, let's see if I can get this. All right, there we go. Um, 
there's research on that people consume media in different ways at different times of day. And one, you know, we had the mobile covered, we had the print covered, we had the, the website during the day. Um, but one way that we didn't have was in the evenings when people are watching TV and they're engaging in news in a different way. And it's starting to be the multi-screen experience, which you all know, you're watching your show and you think, oh, what was that person in? You pull out your phone, you look up IMDb, you know, you're, you're doing different devices. I've had nights where I have my phone and my tablet open and the TV going, because you're doing different stuff on all of them. And so at the same time as, as we were developing apps and, and websites that were optimized for the tablet, they also wanted to explore tablet magazines. Um, and it, what we use is Adobe, a digital publishing system. And so they got a contract with them and <clears throat> they developed a magazine. And they had to come up with a different concept for it though. It couldn't just be what was on the website, it couldn't just be what was in print. But we don't have our own writing staff. Actually, one of my designers is here in the front row, Adrian. We have two designers, we have three editors, and we have no writers. So we have to get our content from everybody else. And so part of it was we had to come up with what is this product going to be? And they decided there were going to be four things. We, each story needed to hit at least one note of this. It needed to be uplifting, informative, fascinating, or amusing. Amusing is a lot harder than you would think of those four. Um, and so we kind of get to go through and pick the cream of the stories from the paper. But as part of that, we, like I mentioned before, we had to evangelize and we had to show people what it was. And you can't just describe it. We actually had to create this, we call it our tablet toolbox, and take it and show people. Because once they see it, they get it. And it's really cool. And its photos look beautiful in this tablet. But we can't just show photos. We have to make it something that we draw the reader in with interactivity. Um, that it's, it, we try to, as best we can, marry good content and the interactive technology. So I'm just going to zap through a couple things in here that we can do. Um, this was a story about a local philanthropist who's building his own bat cave, and the kids can, um, it's for generally ill kids, can come in and they go, they enter through a secret bookcase that like slides over and they get to ride in an actual Batmobile that he has and they get to be kind of a superhero for the day. So um, the, the team who was working on this story was very much a fan of this format. And so they went into the planning of the story knowing they wanted to create some things that were tablet only. So you know, a really simple thing that we can do is annotate photos that you can tap on different things in here. In one of these, we have a video hidden in one of those. Um, so just different activity with the photos. They went and shot. Um, we, it's called an image sequence where you have, it, it seems like you're spinning this, but it's really just a whole bunch of photos in a row. And the Batmobile was on this turntable, so we were able to do something where the reader feels like you're spinning. I'm just rubbing my finger back and forth on the screen to turn it back and forth. We use that for, we have, uh, f we call it spinning plates, where it's a really cool looking dish that the reader can spin, and we've used it different ways. It's a really simple tool, but it can be very effective. Um, the 360s, the 360 photos, um, they now can do this on the website as well, but we have found that it just, it's, it's a really polished way of doing it on this. Um, we have some annotated photos, just simple annotation in different ways. We have some photos that are video photos. Infographics, we have both flat infographics and interactive ones, and they seem to work really well. And it's just, it's such a, a visually good environment that you can get away with this stuff. And I'll see it in print sometimes and just think, ah, oh, it looks so much better on the tie. It just really does. But it can't just look good. It has to have the content behind it, which is part of the challenge. Um, another annotated, you know, we've done that with a lot of weaponry. We just had an F-35 story about the, the new jets coming out to Luke, and they were able to annotate the jet to show where all the different stealth technology was in it. Um, one way in which we kind of hide how much content is there, sometimes we can have scrollable frames on the page. We try not to do that too much, but that's one way we kind of hide how long the stories are for folks. Um, you know, different ways of presenting the photos. It's just, a, it's a, not, it, the tools are fairly simple, but it changes the way that the reporters start thinking about the stories, knowing what they can do. Um, you know, the swipe photos. When the Lord of the Rings movie came out, we wanted to kind of create a little game, and we decided to 
to take out the faces of the, of the dwarves and see if you could name the dwarf. And you swipe the photo and the face comes in and we decided to go one more step, swipe it, and you see what the actor looks like without any of the makeup. And it was that additional stuff that made it so cool for people. Um, just, uh, one of our favorite things, and it's what just HTML5 coding, it's very simple. Um, is, are these photo scrubs for readers that we try to find historical photos and modern photos that match up really well and you, the, the reader just scrubs to reveal it. And so we try to have one of those in about every other issue because it's very popular. The hard part of that is finding the historical photos. Now that we're a year and a half into it, we're starting to run out of stuff that we can, can really use. So um, again, the 360, there's another one of our spinning plates. And everyone likes that one because the ice cream looks good. Uh, this was a case of a story that we went into planning it really well from the beginning of knowing we wanted interactivity. We had um, different parts of it that you could control just by scrubbing back and forth. And there's really no point to this particular feature of the story <laughs> other than it's just fun. And it pulls you into this fairly long story about the, the process, the policies, all of the, the stuff in it, we are able to put video in there where we want the video to be in the story, as opposed to online. And it's changing with online, but right now we just have the video up at the top of the story, and there's really just the one video, whereas we can put it where we want it to be. Um, we had another one in here. This is another image sequence where you can make the train go back and forth. Again, no point to this <laughs> other than it just makes you part of the story, and it might keep you in the story a little bit longer. and you know, just make you think, okay, um, what this, we can take news that you're tired of hearing about or this kind of scary, like the fiscal cliff, and we made it into an interactive graphic that, that did kind of like what Bill says, where we're not going to throw a huge long story at you, we're going to give you the precise information you need and draw you in with the interactivity and make you read a story that by that point you were tired of reading about fiscal cliff, but if we can present it in a way that draws you in a little bit more, um, this is one of Adrian's infographics from, from a year ago, actually. Um, this is a, an example of, it's a flat infographic, it's not interactive, but because of the, the color, because of the visual possibility of, this tab, of the tablet, it is still very interesting to see it in this. I mean, honestly, I see some of our stories sometimes run in print later, and I think, ugh, it just it doesn't look as good. I just, I don't want to read that story. Um, and part of it, too, is that we have to run stories before they run in print. And that was just our marching orders from the beginning. And so uh, you can imagine how, how difficult it was to get everyone to not only meet their deadlines, but meet their deadlines a couple days early for us. So that is a constant challenge for us. Um, this is another example of an infographic that presents information in such a concise way, and it is interactive. It shows how the 10 airlines became three, and as you scroll down through the time, and you can tap on the different dots, and it shows you what happened at that point, and as it goes down, and down, and down, and down, and you end up with a three. And it's just a simple way of presenting it uh, that to say all that in text would be boring, but to show it visually. Through a few of these. This was another one where we wanted to show, uh, this was some information we had in an old slideshow on Easy Central forever. It was about some endangered species in the state. And we decided, let's have it be a tappable map. And it shows you exactly which counties of the state it was. And that, as we showed it to people, they said, oh, that's really cool. And it's so basic, but it's just a different way of doing it. Um, you can do audio only on tablet is probably one of the few things that you can do that, that online can't also do. Um, and so there are certain stories like this one. It was a theater troupe for people with um, disabilities. And the audio, rather than video, was perfect for it because you could listen to it as you were looking through photos of the people in there. And so it just it really worked. We have high-res photos that you can zoom in on. Um, we have covers that we've integrated. And some of these are really old, actually, in this toolbox. We've, we've improved our, our understanding of some of the, the technical parts of this. Um, simple animation, where it's just the calories are ticking up there. It's a really simple touch, but it is an elegant way of having some interactivity in the story. So um, <clears throat> we put a lot of quizzes in there, ways people can can tap and they can find out which animal's eating that for breakfast and different things of that. How so. many of these things are on the website as well as the tablet or are these all tablet specific? It's, we, 
a lot of the stories, the longer stories, are absolutely in multiple places. Like, because like I said, we don't have a writing staff. We do sometimes create fun things um, that we try to, we try to have a few things that we protect because there has to be a reason someone comes here. And that is a challenge because readers have pointed that out. Hey, I saw that story in the paper. Why would I read it in both places? But it is in both the paper and online and people are used to that. So it's really trying to find a different slice. Okay, if they run the full story online, maybe we'll do the video and an infographic. Or sometimes we do the whole story anyway. And so that's a part of the discussion each week and we're putting together the issues is what do we do that's different? What do we do that's the same? What about the interactive graphics? Are those also on the website? Um, not as many. That is a way that I can't think of that many. Um, we do have a web viewer now that they've developed for us that we can share a story, an individual story, into there, and they're hoping that to be able to repurpose a lot more of our infographics that way. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, let's move on. Gary, you've got some things to show us. So let's Thank see if this will work. That's a hard act to follow. Does it let you take it over? Do I need to get up? We'll find out. He's nodding. I'm out. Are we good, Chris? I'm in. By my switch, it says mirroring is on. That's a right to turn on and off. Uh oh. While they figure that out, <laughs> I would just, I would add, I think what you just showed um, really helps me make my point about the way in which you consume news. Because if I'm on Twitter, then I see that Philip, you know, Seymour Hoffman died and I'm like, oh my gosh, he died. But maybe I don't have time to like consume all of that article right now, but later there's something like this where I can go and like figure out like what happened and, and things like that. And, so. and that is, they wanted this to be the sit back experience, kicking back on your couch with your tablet rather than sitting at your desktop. And we do tend to have um, videos that people watch to completion on here as opposed to the desktop where you do tend to move on more quickly. And so knowing that, that we do tend to tailor the information for that. And we have, um, People generally spend 10 to 30 minutes when we look at our analytics. They'll spend 10 to 30 minutes per issue, which is a really long time considering most people are on the website about, I think, like four to eight minutes kind of range. So, um, but it's fewer people, you know, so it's kind of, you, it's, you have to hit everybody where they are is the challenge. And not everyone's going to want to sit and read a long magazine article. Some people just want to hit the, the fast news and move on. So you have to have it in all of the places. Um, while we're setting up, um, Penny, um, how do you get the tablet product? You can search in the App Store for AZ Today, and it is also in Android. Um, the, I will say the Android is limited functionality, and that's not because of Android itself. It's because Adobe has, um, they've optimized it for the iPad. Yeah, so it's better on an iPad, but it is on Android. And we, at the moment, don't have any plans to put it on the phone because it's just, not, it wouldn't be as good an experience on the smaller. But eventually all phones and tablets seem to be going toward the same size, so we'll right. see what happens. How are we doing? Um, okay. Yeah, and it is, it is, you have to have the subscription, but there are some free issues in there, so if you download the app, you well, can Well, while them. we're um, trying to get the next set of visuals up, let me ask all three of you a question about audience. When you develop a product, you know, how important, or even decide whether to develop a product. You know, what what are you thinking about in terms of an audience? How important is the the particular audience to the design and the building and testing of, of a product? And I'm assuming you're dealing with different audiences for different products. Do you guys want to? I went first last time. Okay. Well, <laughs> so what they do is we have a leadership committee that meets on a regular basis and at the beginning of every year, they, they talk about what they call, they, they deem or they term them passion topics. And these passion topics are based on a lot of data that they went out, a lot of surveys that are done for different uh, age groups and different uh, subject matters and things like that. And what they, they decide that, you know, we want to attack something in entertainment or we'd like to do a tablet version or something like that. And then 
uh, we put project teams together and they they review that data and decide yeah that's what we're going to do and so we kind of move forward in that way um, with the tablet, they did know it was going to be an, an older audience simply because you tend to have more money to spend on a tablet if you've had a job for a while. Um, so it, it, they are trying to skew it lower as we, younger as we go. And we just had a survey come out, a reader survey, and it was actually a lot stronger in the Gen Xers than they expected. They thought it would be more boomers. But there are times that I will say to our designers, um, who, who are both younger, I will point out, like, no, that needs to be bigger because it's older eyes who are trying to look at it. I appreciate you know, Things like that. Um, yeah, but uh, in the end, if something's really cool and really well written, it's going to appeal across markets. So. For us, um, we've gotten into the role of asking a lot more questions about the audience up front. Um, before we kind of took things on faith, it was kind of like, hey, we have an idea for a project, let's build it. And so we would build this thing and we would get 10,000 page views. And that sounds like a lot until you consider the fact that we're getting millions and millions and millions of page views. And so it's a drop in the bucket. And so when you spend development resources, you take three developers and a designer and a tester and you throw all this up and then you look at and you, you mash the numbers and you go, wow, we spent a lot to get that 10,000 page views. So now we spend a lot more time analyzing our data, what we know about the audience. Um, who's this going to appeal to? How are they using it? How do you know that this is a product that they're actually going to use? Um, how do we build something a lot smaller that we can scale later? So now even in the initial planning stages, our data and what our data suggests about our audience is um, considered a lot more. Sure, so this, um, this is a draft app. It was a second screen app we, we wrote last year um, for the 2012 draft, uh, or 2013, I'm sorry. And we wrote this in three weeks. Um, it went from conception to release in that time. And so we went every, we created a pick six Facebook game. We incorporated um, video feeds that were being brought in from all over the place. We were pulling in sports network feed data, so we were getting round picks, and there was just a lot going on. And the idea for this app was um, the sports fan who's watching ESPN, they're watching the draft, but they're also a Cardinals fan. This is something they're gonna pick up and use while you know the commercial breaks, or hey, what's going on with the Cardinals right now? So that was our intended audience for this app. This one right here, uh, you can kind of see hopefully with some of my, my scribbles and scratches on there. I whiteboard a lot and sketch a lot, so you can kind of see how this came around. So this is um, AZ Best. AZ Best is a product that basically across critics and users, you can vote for everything from your favorite coffee places to your favorite bars, all these different things, and then we create the best list, essentially. This was the first year we did something different. Um, our driving focus for this product was discoverability. We wanted the product to live a lot longer than the weekend that the results were released. And so this actually went across a voting phase, a nomination phase, and then finally the results phase. For the voting phase, um, the idea was for the web app itself, it would use location. So you could actually nominate the place where you're at. So you know if you're eating pizza at a particular place and they're like, hey, by the way, you should nominate us for best pizza. And so you could crank this thing up and it would immediately say, hey, are you here? And it's like, yes, I am. Okay, great, you wanna vote? Yes, I do, and then you're done. And the idea was for the app to get out of the way, to go ahead and let you vote and get back to actually enjoying your pizza and having you know, a good meal. This next one here, this is based off the same kind of concept. Um, built this inside of what we call 10% time. Um, if you're familiar with some of the things that Google does, they also have 20% time. Well, we have to reduce it down with our workload. But this concept is called Near Me. And the idea is that the context for news isn't about when it was published, but it's about location, where you are at this particular time. If you imagine that you're, you're at your house, you're sitting out front, you're talking to friends, and all of a sudden the police zoom by, right? And they've, they've stopped like three streets over, the lights are blaring, you're like, what in the world is going on down there, right? So the context for you at this particular time is location. So the idea here was that you know we present 
news based upon your location. So you can see in the lower side there, there's a map and all the different little spots represent news articles. And then the, to the left, or to my right rather, um, was the, the mobile side of this where you could check in the places that you're at. So it was a way of us trying to determine a, a revenue model behind this. This hasn't actually gone out, it's still just being worked on, but it's a concept right now. This is our mobile responsive app. This is as it's displayed on landscape on the iPad. Now it will actually scale across any devices, whether you're on mobile, tablet, wherever you're at. And this is one of those cases where we have one code base and it works everywhere. Um, and you know, it, it's pretty straightforward stuff. We've got news categories and this presents slideshows and videos and all types of different articles. And it just scales based upon what device you're on. This is a concept design we did. We have a product called Explore AZ. And right now it's, its concept is it presents um, top 10 items in a particular area. So if you're in Flagstaff, for example, these are the top 10 places that you wanna go to. So we released the product and based upon the data we had, it, we didn't get the sort of response we would have liked. Um, it got good response and, and the response has grown, or grown since we put more in our print product but we still haven't gotten the sort of response that we wanted from it. So the idea was, well, what can we do different? And so the idea behind this product was that instead of focusing in on top 10 list, um, what if we created an actual interactive guide based upon one particular thing? Like I'm going to Flagstaff for the weekend and I'm, I'm really into stargazing. So in this particular case, you can build your interactive guide based upon your interest to a particular area that you're going to. So in this, in this screen, I've chosen stargazing and I'm going to Sedona. And then this shows what that interactive guide would actually look like. So the idea behind this is either A, you have decided that you're gonna head out to Sedona, right? You, you don't really have a plan, you're just gonna roll out for the weekend. So you hit the road, you stop, and you're eating dinner in Sedona somewhere, and you're like, hey, what do we wanna do? So you, you crank this thing up, and. The app is designed for you to interact with it. It's meant for you to spend time with it. You know, hey, check this out. These are the things we should do. It tells us that we should go here and check this out. That's a really good idea. So it's about leveraging the, the content that AZ Central already has and our expertise and putting it in a format that, um, that's a lot more fun. And I think that's, yeah, that's all the ones I have on here. Any questions? Thank you. We'll, we'll um, cover a couple more things and then we'll get to uh, plenty of time for questions for everybody. I do want to ask the panel, you know, we've all heard that mobile is the future and in fact, quite possibly that future has, is right now. But um, while computer ownership has plateaued in recent years, it's about three-fourths of um, residents of the United States have, have uh, of computers. Um, cell phone ownership is 82% of the American public, and the percentage of uh, Americans with internet-enabled smartphones is up to 56 percent. Um, uh, but all of these different devices present different challenges for people like you. And so how do you decide what content to market on what kind of device? Well, ours obviously, you know, we have the magazine approach, so that sort of lends itself to that. Um, I wish that Sam was here because she would be able to speak to the pop, you know, we build the stuff, but, but she's in the group that populates it. I do know from sitting in on meetings that um, very much they see what's trending on different devices and they will tailor what they're presenting. And it sort of sounds like a cheap trick. It's like, oh, everyone's Googling you know, Taylor Swift, so let's put a Taylor Swift story on there so we get hits. But they do try to do it in a, a thoughtful way of, let's not just throw something up there to do it, but how, what are they talking about? How can we present a story or some information or a slideshow or something that isn't just trying to get the hit, but is trying to feed into what is happening in that moment? Um, and there's different times of day that th different information is presented that people are more interested in. You know, you want to see the traffic reports before you drive home. You, at your lunch break, want to hit different kinds of news than you do in the morning. Um, and so they do have a cycle to the, and I'm, I'm not part of that, so I can't speak mm -hmm. to it with any great detail, but I do 
you know that they, that, that comes into play. And Bill, is it quick hit stuff that you do on phones and you do the you know, more of the magazine-y stuff on a tablet and... Well, I, I think that in the editorial process, they sit and they say, well, what assets do we have? And so if you've got a lot of photos, then it's gonna play on the desktop and mobile. And so they'll, they'll put it in both. Okay. But a lot of times they'll put the meat of the story or more of the editorial in, in the print product, but we still wanna represent that on mobile. So if you get the paper and the, you read it and you just, you, maybe you've seen it again on the phone and you wanna get more, then they'll provide videos, they'll provide slideshows and things like that. So I, I think with the, you know, moving towards a cost model uh, for content, I think you're gonna see more and more that no matter what the story, it's going to play on every everywhere you can get that article. I think they're going to want to put it there. Even like long articles on phones, which I'm seeing Correct. more of people Correct. accessing video on phones Correct. and longer articles on phones. But, but I think, uh, sorry, uh, one last thing. I think when you offer a cost model and you say this is our ecosystem, that, that you're going to want to consume that the way you're comfortable. So, so you, you got to put it everywhere because not everyone has a desktop anymore. They, they use their cell phone. So, so you want to make sure you capture the audience there and give them the ability to get it anywhere they consume data or information. Yeah, some of the challenge of that is simply the packaging. Because like you said, to read a long article on a phone is not the most pleasant experience in the world. Um, but I do encourage you, if you haven't looked at Vanity Fair's phone app, um, in the newsstand on the phone. They've, they've set it up in a really interesting way that each story is just a one column drop. There's a sometimes an illustration at the top, but there is no razzle dazzle to this. It is just readable on your phone and that's all you want just on your text. phone. Yeah, you don't want to have to try to zoom in on things, but they've done it in a really smart way and they set it up, um, their table of contents is set up by how long it'll take you to read the articles. Not so much the topic, but if you have five minutes waiting in line, you want to read this story. If you're going to be in the waiting room for half an hour, you want this story. And so I, I just thought that was a, an, an interesting way of treating um, treating something and really dealing with someone who wants to read, but all they have is the phone. So, yeah, that's really smart. Yeah. Gary, did you want to jump in here? Or? No, I, I pretty much agree with with both sentiments. It's uh, I think we have to get out of the business of considering what the device's um, drawbacks are and get more consumed with the capabilities. So that the play off of Bill's point, it's, you know, be where the reader is. That, that's the key and they're everywhere. And you, you can't control that. So the old days of saying, look, you need to be on this type of computer with this type of resolution at this particular time, that, that goes away. Okay. It's too limiting and it doesn't work in our, in our environment. All right. Just well, one other point. Yeah, sure. It's, so imagine if, if you're on your desktop right now, and let's say you wanted a Jimmy John sub, and you want to deliver it here. So you went online, you found the store, you logged in, you ordered the sandwich. 15 minutes later, it shows up. So everywhere you go on the web after that, you get a Jimmy John's ad. So they, they know you've been there. And so if you do online shopping or anything like that, everywhere you go, you'll see that advertising. Imagine if you will, uh, you start to read articles about uh, guns, for instance, on AZ Central. I think the future is gonna be predictive so that if you clicked on a bunch of gun articles or, or gun related uh, articles, then in the future, they're gonna deliver that to you in that way. So, so it's no longer going to be an editorial process where they think this is what the user should see and this is what the user should see. It's going to be more like this user likes these, so we're going to give them that. So, so there's already people out there creating these predictive engines that take all of this metadata about you, and then they're going to start giving you news based on where you go and how you consume news. I don't know. I find that a little scary. Okay. Um, let's talk for just a minute about apps um, versus mobile versions of websites. And I think right now consumer surveys show that people still prefer apps, but that may be switching. And I know like uh, is CNN and the New York Times have created mobile versions of their websites. Where is that going? Well, I, I think it has a lot to do with cost. And so a lot of newspapers and think people like that are going to start to shrink uh, the development in favor of uh, quick development. And so when you start talking about quick development, I think it's easier if you utilize a tool to crank out a website than it is to have a development department, a department that does that for you. And so I'll give you a for instance. When we first created the first AZ Central News app, uh, we, we had this struggle between using a product called PhoneGap uh, where you could crank out uh, a news application using JavaScript, and anyone could do that. Uh, or we could learn uh, Objective-C and write it 
uh, natively. And so we went back and forth on this, and then we eventually decided to write it natively. And it brings me to my point that I think if you want to utilize the device uh, to its capability, I think you have to go native. But if you're looking at a cost-effective way of putting out an app in a short amount of time, I think using one of these tools is going to become more and more a thing. So if I'm Bill, Bill's Pizza and, and I have a small budget and I want to put a, an, an iPhone app out there, I'm going to hire somebody that can use one of these tools and crank something out in a few days and get me in the market. And all it may do is uh, order a pizza via this app or it may uh, monitor the progress of my delivery or something like that. But if you're a news organization and you want to like utilize the entire device, push notifications, and maybe you put a crossword puzzle in there that has all your news headlines or, or, or something like this, then I think you have to go native. And, and I think it, it has to do with that more than anything. Okay. Yeah, I would add that there's, a, there's an ebb and flow, I think, depending on what's going on. You know, you, right now we're very much in that app side of things. Um, interesting conversation that we had the other day was, how many apps do you have on your phone right now? And do you really want another one? Um, and do it, you use them? Right. right. Now, to Bill's point, you know, really what should be driving it isn't necessarily trend, but it's about what you want people to accomplish with your app. You know, we're talking strictly consumption. There's no need for a native app as far as I'm concerned because everything that a native app is going to do can be done on the mobile web. And there's even a lot of things that you can push the envelope with HTML5 and so many JavaScript libraries out there that, you know, things like sound, like you mentioned earlier, um, we can actually accomplish that on the web. It's not as fluid as it is on a native device, but we keep pressing things forward. Um, they, you know, the other problem too with native apps is fragmentation. You know, there's so many different versions of Android, and now there's so many different versions of iOS out there that it gets tougher. So again, you know, it, the cost effectiveness of building a, a mobile web app versus native comes into play heavily. Right. I want to just bring Penny in here on tablets. Um, there has been some debate about the future of tablets, whether everything's just going to go to basically phone devices, and also whether news organizations should even get into the tablet business. So. Give us a little crystal ball on tablets. Well, I would love if it succeeds, because then I get to keep having a job. Um, part of the challenge is building the habit of it. Even if people are kicking back on their couch at night, they may not necessarily think to go to a tablet magazine. And you know, I had a tablet in my position for a few months before I got on the tablet team, and I didn't really use it that much. It wasn't only until it was my job. It, I thought, oh, there's actually a lot of stuff on here that I, I would want to use. Um, Martha Stewart Magazine, which has you know legions of hardcore fans, they uh, that magazine, I think, only had... I'm going to get the number wrong, but it's a surprisingly low conversion rate for the digital. And they started off including the digital with your subscription, and it was something like 4%. Wow. of the readers went onto the digital version. And these are people who love that magazine. And the magazine looks good on there as well, you know, and had additional things. So it's kind of like, well, if they can't get that many more people, then what hope do, do startups have? Um, the challenge for us, once we get it in someone's hand and they look at it and they say, this is really cool, and yeah, I want, I want more of this, but it's getting people to download it and to look at it because it's not a habit. You know, the phone is much easier, and it may be that eventually it all does kind of merge into these larger phones or the smaller tablets. Um, so, you know, that's part of the challenge is no one quite knows what, what it's going to be. But until then, we have to keep turning out excellent product. Okay. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, I want to give uh, you all time for questions, and I think we have uh, someone here with the microphone. So if you have a question, raise your hand. She'll bring you the microphone and um, ask away. This is your chance to ask uh, three people on a business you might want to get into someday. Um, um, so let's see, you mentioned how you can have advertising catered to you on the internet, and we see that a lot, um, and that you think the future would be in having news articles catered to you. So then I guess this question, knowing that is directed more towards um, Penny, because she's more on the journalism side, do you think that catering what people want to see kind of is going to just promote close-mindedness? Do you think that's really what you know, like the general audience wants? Is that a good direction it, to go? Because I, I've heard yeah. about it before. 
Yeah, it's a good question. It is a good question, and it is a good debate to have because how much do you give people what they want and how much do you give them what they should have? You know, it's the give the kid the vegetables kind of thing. And even if someone only wants to read quick hits, should you still be forcing this other stuff on them if they never, ever bother to read it? You know, so it's got to be a balance somewhere in there, and everything is an experiment with it. Um, but you can't just say, well, we only want to give people the news. You know, it's like we give them the front page of the print newspaper and we put the big news as we see it. Um, and definitely there is the side of it that you want to continue doing that. You want to continue saying this is an important story, even if it doesn't, if it's not a sexy story, but it's still important. There's or, if a it lot doesn't, or if it doesn't fit your profile somehow, yeah, things you've looked at before. There's a lot of journalism that's not sexy. But, but it's still important for people to read. And so how do you get that to them? Is it simply a presentation that looks really good? Is it, um, you know, the sort of those, what was the headline that someone got in trouble? Was it New York Times or somebody just got in trouble for one of those, you know, you won't believe, you won't believe it headlines kind of thing. And it was for a very serious story. You know, people are trying that kind of stuff. And sometimes it doesn't work. And sometimes it's really embarrassing. Uh, for the organization that tries it. But I don't think you can simply say, we're not going to be responsive at all. We're going to continue doing what we're doing, even if it doesn't work. So you, you have know, to for me, it's not even uh, all a matter of what I need to know versus what I want to know. It's an element of surprise. Um, and I don't know if that resonates with any of you, but like one of the things I like about listening to NPR, for example, is because they have the most bizarre stories about things I would never think to you know, look up you know this particular story, mm -hmm. and it surprises me with things that I don't know that I want to know about. So where does that come in, Bill, in your in your brave new world? Well, I really don't know. <laughs> uh, I spent a few years with the, the content and things like that. I, I just think that the future is going to be where you, they're, they're gonna know the types of news that you wanna consume, be it if you tell them or if they keep track of you. One way or another, they're gonna know. It's and true. so I'm thinking that there's gotta be some synergy between an approach like that and the ability to bring in something that's breaking, something that's very important uh, into an app like this that's sort of canned before it's delivered. So, so you can like somehow bring in uh, breaking news and things like that. I think that's sort of the marriage for the future. There's also the question of curating, and that's what some newspapers or some media organizations are trying out, is where it's uh, it's almost like personality curating, that you, you go to this website because you trust that that, whoever's putting together the news, you like what they put together. You don't want the general news of a general newspaper website. You want that, you want to go to Upworthy because you like the kind of stories that they present. Or not necessarily you have an the, NPR profile. Yeah, not necessarily <laughs> the specific topics, but you like how they think, or they have uh, the websites now now, like quarterly.co, the shopping websites where you can sign up. You don't know what you're going to get. You pay 40 bucks and you pick a personality that you like because you like their blog or you like the way they put together some website or you like Bill Nye the Science Guy. He started on Quarterly just recently and you just this surprise of, I don't know, I trust them and whatever is going to be in that box is going to be something I like. And sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. And so th um, there are media organizations who are looking at that shopping uh, technique and trying to figure out a way to present the news that way of, of having it be driven by personalities. And we do that too, that we get a lot behind our calmness pers personalities and tr probably bank on those a little bit more than we should sometimes. Um, but that is a good question. I think that's going to be the debate over the next few no, years. That's, that's really go interesting. To, uh, go to Yahoo right now and, and look at their redesign. They're already doing it. So if you go in the sports section, you go to any one of those little portals. Let's say you chose NBA because it's popular right now. And you looked at the top story. If you scroll, you can, I challenge you, just keep going. Just keep, it'll just keep scrolling, and the news, it'll go back in time, obviously, but, I mean, it's a never-ending thing, and I think that's what users want. They want to be able to, like, sit there and just keep going, and, and if you choose this story or that story, when you land, after you get there, all of the related stuff just keeps going, and so they're already, like, moving us in that direction. And I think what they did with their redesign, it was perfect. I really like what they did. Great. Time for another question or two? Anybody else out there? Come on, curious. One more question. Over here, Adrian. Yeah. 
So um, I'm working with a class of students this semester who, is who are going to be developing their first um, digital publication um, with Adobe DPS. And I was just wondering what each of you guys would um, say in terms of usability, because um, they don't have much technical control and they'll be doing a lot of their own um, edit selecting um, editing content, but they will be doing a lot of the design work. Um, and uh, pulling their own articles. So what would you say in terms of usability is the best way to present, or biggest concerns when presenting journalistic, like journalistic content? Thank you. you start? No, I Gary? I think the first thing you have to do is you have to, don't get caught up in the neat factor just because it's there. Like, because you can shadow what you're really trying to accomplish, right? At the end of the day, you're trying to tell a really compelling story or a series of compelling stories. And sometimes it's dragging over the gee whiz thing. It just gets in the way. Um, so it stands to reason just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. And that's, that's the first thing. So. And you can also set yourself up for failure too, because you throw all, you bake all this stuff in, and then you find yourself trying to work backwards to undo it. And that's that's a problem that at, for a developer we have. You know, we want to do all this really cool stuff, right? It's like, yeah, let's bake this and let's add this, let's add this, let's add this, and we got away from the core of what we were trying to accomplish. And now what we find ourselves doing is that the the final hour we're pulling stuff out, we're debugging, we're doing all these things. So we can be our own worst enemy in that respect. For the non-technical people, focus on their strengths. That's the key. The tool is there to help facilitate the strength. Don't let it get in the way of what they're trying to accomplish. So if a pen and a pad is the best way to accomplish it, that's what they should be using. That's everything that we do with these devices, even across all the technology. If we do it right, the technology gets out of the way. You know, Bill makes, you know, this is what people are doing now. Yeah, because the technology gets out of the way. They can do these things because that's what they like. So same approach for you and, and, and the students. Just don't worry so much about the technology side, but really focus on the journalism and telling that really good story. You guys have anything to add, Penny? Um, well, I was trying to get this to work again so I could show a few examples, but Adrienne already knows some of these because she works on them. But um, what surprises me with the, the technical stuff is how much old school kind of arts and crafts we do with this, as much as we have the technology capable to us. A lot of our coolest covers are when we build some, like physically build, you know, Adrian did like a Lego wall that they did a stop motion video to for an adoption story. Um, for our Christmas cover, we actually made a physical luminaria and, and filmed that. Um, you know, things like that that don't necessarily you just think it's all going to be the. It sounds the like really arts and crafts class. Yes, yeah. you know, and it's not always that way, and sometimes just straight photos and, and that kind of stuff. But don't necessarily turn away from the 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 art background or the story. But you know, the story background too. Like he was saying, the story is always central, no matter how you you present it. And if it's just cotton candy, the reader's gonna know that eventually. It has to look good, but it has to be able to be read and it has to make sense. And and you know, if, if you can just use a tool just to use it, it's like, well, you know, you want there to be a little bit of razzle dazzle, like we would say with, from the very beginning, we'd always kind of say, What's the happy finger thing in this issue? What's the thing they're gonna play on the screen? But we didn't we realized there had to be a rhythm. It couldn't be every story couldn't be that interactive, that sometimes people need the, the rhythm of, okay, now it's flat. Now I can just relax and read. And now I get back into it where I do that. And so I think all technology has to have that in it. Well, that kind of brings us back to the beginning, which is it's all about fundamentally, at some point, about journalism, right? About the content. So um, please thank our panelists. And thank you all for coming tonight. <laughs>